How did Arthur Schopenhauer think we could best become aware of noumenal will? Through aesthetic experience, especially of nature and music, we can become aware of the noumenal world. Schopenhauer's theory of nature appreciation is a modification of Immanuel Kant's. 17241804, Notion of the Sublime Schopenhauer thought that there is tranquility in the experience of the beautiful. But that the experience of the sublime, such as in watching a storm, requires an active participation. Thus, the observer tears himself away from his own will. In contemplating the sublime object by a free exaltation. Music is a pure expression of the absolute noumenal will. In listening to music, which expresses the universal will. We directly become universal subjects, bypassing our own individual wills. How did Imre Lakato's research program reconcile Popper and Kuhn's work? Lakatos, 1922-1974, described a scientific method to both. Allow for progress and explain how science had developed. Instead of talking about theories, he introduced the notion of a research program. Which consisted of both theories and accepted research practices in a given field. Every research program has a core, or protective belt, of claims that could not be falsified. Degenerating research programs have growing protective belts and fail to predict new facts or create new projects for discovery, they survive by adding ad hoc hypotheses. Progressive research programs are able to support new projects of discovery that do not produce vast amounts of falsifying data requiring revision of the core, they do not significantly rely on ad hoc hypotheses. The way that Lakatos reconciled the discrepancy between Popper and Kuhn's account of science was to shift ground from the static relationship between facts and theories to the dynamic nature of scientific practice. Popper's view was that scientific truth changes when theories are falsified. Whereas Kuhn thought that theories were not falsified so much as overthrown. Lakatos made scientific practice, rather than beliefs about the truth of theories, his subject. How did the Church react to Galileo's theories? In an act that remains famous to this day, the Inquisition ordered Galileo, 1564-1642, to recant his theories and placed him under house arrest during the last decade of his life. Before that time, however, Cardinal Bellarmine tried for years to persuade Galileo to accept a compromise. The Church did not object to the Copernican theory so long. As it was not claimed to be a description of what was true. The Cardinal told a friend of Galileo's that it would be acceptable if he claimed that the Copernican theory did no more than save the appearances, that is, 
provide a hypothesis from which astronomical observations could be logically deduced without claiming that Earth actually moved. Galileo was, in the end, forced to do exactly that. Although at the outset he refused to deny the truth of the Copernican theory as a true astronomical description. What was Edmund Husserl's phenomenological method? Husserl thought the task of the philosopher was to perform an empirical reduction of intentional objects of consciousness by describing what is in the mind without making a commitment to the reality of the mental content. That is, Husserl thought that we should describe what appears to be so to us without making a commitment that it is so. G, my cat is sitting on my computer, but Husserl would prefer that I stick to my impressions or the representations in my mind of the cat sitting on the computer. This is a special perspective, distinctive from the natural attitudes of ordinary people and scientists who address actual things that exist in the world. For Husserl, there is no philosophical distinction between a content of consciousness that is a dream or a fantasy and one that corresponds to something happening in reality. There were, however, different types of reduction for Husserl. Most notably epoche in which the truth and reality of the objects of consciousness are bracketed. This bracketing of truth or reality was exactly the same thing as not making a commitment to the truth or reality. Husserl would have wanted me to describe the cat on my computer and my perception of it. But to stop short of claiming that the cat really is sitting on my commuter. Also influential was Husserl's eidetic reduction that had as its subjects acts of consciousness itself. An eidetic intuition that pertained to the essences of objects of consciousness. Thus, analysis of perception, which is something that consciousness does, would be an example of eidetic reduction. Whereas analysis of what is being perceived would be an example of eidetic intuition. This distinction was to prove very influential in Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy. Where he distinguished between consciousness as awareness and what we are conscious or aware of. Who was Aspasia of Miletus? Aspasia of Miletus, c. 470 c. 400 BCE, was an influential member of the Sophistic movement. She was married to Pericles, 495 to 429 BCE, considered to be knowledgeable about statecraft. And was said to have taught Socrates himself rhetoric. When she was put on trial on charges of impiety, her husband secured her acquittal. Why is gender an important topic in studies of early modern philosophy? Social and family life, generally, and ideas about the sexes were so different. In the 17th century compared to our own that they should not be. 
overlooked as an important background to the beginnings of modern philosophy. Interestingly, all the well-known 17th century philosophers Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Hobbes, and Locke were bachelors their entire lives. As were the great majority of their colleagues in philosophy and the sciences. Who is Lucy Rigoret? Luce Iragoray, 1932, was born in Belgium and attended Jacques Lacan's psychoanalytic seminars in the 1960s. She is famous for having written, Sexual difference is probably the issue in our time which could be our salvation if we thought it through, and one must assume the feminine role deliberately. Which means already to convert a form of subordination into an affirmation, and thus to thwart it. Ira Gray's main writings include An Ethics of Sexual Difference, 1982, and J.E. 2. News, Toward a Culture of Difference, 1990. How did John Stuart Mill define the difference between higher and lower pleasures? Mill did not think that a simple quantitative calculus could be used to make moral decisions. He argued that there were lower pleasures that were mainly connected with immediate physical gratification and delight and higher pleasures that involved delayed gratification or prior diligence. The higher pleasures, such as those found in the cultivation and enjoyment of art, literature, poetry, and friendship, were better than the lower pleasures. Mill's proof that they were better was the testimony of those who had experienced both the lower and higher pleasures. Who was Thomas Hobbes? More than any other 17th century philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679 directly applied the atomism and materialism of the science of his day to metaphysics Hobbes believed that everything in existence was caused by matter and motion he was one of René Descartes 1596 to 1650 early critics and was considered an atheist by his peers Hobbes is most famous for his description of the natural condition of mankind as solitary. Poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Who was Galileo? Galileo Galilei, 1564-1642, was an Italian natural philosopher, physicist, and astronomer. He defended the Copernican system in dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, which included a series of arguments against Aristotelian astronomy. Most strikingly, he argued that the heavens and earth had the same kind of motion and that it was not necessary to postulate a teleological or goal-driven system for celestial movement. That is, it was not necessary to claim, as Aristotle had done, 
that the movement of the heavenly bodies was caused by what they were striving for. What is the Tao? The Tao, or Way, advocated by Confucius involves appropriately performing one's roles in the family and society according to Jen, or loving respect for others. All are presumed to be equal in acting according to Jen. And if all act in this manner, the whole of society and the world will be improved. Did any of the early modern male philosophers consider the position of women in their writing? Yes. René Descartes, 1596-1650, deliberately wrote his Discourse on Method, 1637, in French. In part so that women, who were not usually taught Latin, would be able to read it. Hobbes considered women to be just as strong and free as men in the original state of nature and talked about their consent being necessary to enter into marriage. He also referred to the power of women when he called them Lord Mothers to whom their children were obligated if they had nurtured and raised them, instead of abandoning them to fortune. John Locke, 1632-1704, thought that the doctrine of the divine right of kings, which was based on heredity from Adam, simply left out the existence of female parents. He described marriage as a partnership for the sake of procreation and raising children and suggested that once children were grown the husband and wife could go their separate ways if they chose. In his Thoughts Concerning Education, 1693, written in response to his cousin's questions about how young men should be raised. Locke wrote that girls should receive basically the same education as boys. What are some details of the Marquis de Sada's life? De Sada was born in the palace of Condet. His father was a count, his mother a lady-in-waiting to the princess. He attended a Jesuit college and was captain of a cavalry regiment in the Seven Years' War. After which he married the elder sister of the woman he loved, fathering two sons and one daughter. In 1766 he had a theatre constructed at his castle in Lacoste, in the 1990s. Fashion designer Pierre Cardin acquired the ruins of de Sada's castle as a site for theatre productions. He was a libertine, said to have sexually abused young people of both sexes, both servants, and prostitutes. He was accused of kidnapping and abusing a woman named Rose Keller in 1768, after she escaped. He was also accused of blasphemy which was a more serious offense at the time than the sexual crimes. When prostitutes in Paris complained of de Sada's abuse, he was exiled to his castle. Then he had an affair with his sister-in-law, for which his mother-in-law secured an arrest warrant from the king. A series of arrests and escapes in which his wife was his accomplice ensued. 
he was confined to an insane asylum at Charenton after being imprisoned in the Bastille. In the asylum, the abbe allowed him to produce plays. When he was released in 1790, his wife divorced him. How did George Berkeley's theory of vision relate to the concept of matter and physical existence? Berkeley is well known for his theory of vision that contributed so much to modern psychology of perception. However, in that theory he completely repudiated the primary bastion of empiricism, namely, matter. Berkeley departed from both common sense and science in elaborately insisting that matter the entire physical world based on our best evidence, simply did not exist in the way that the other empiricists Hobbes, Locke and Hume, and later on, John Stuart Mill and Bertrand Russell assumed that it did. For any serious student of the history of philosophy, Berkeley is either a delightful aberration or an intractable obstacle because of this position. What general philosophical problems does environmentalism pose? In more traditional philosophical terms, there are ontological and metaphysical issues involved in what counts as a unit in environmentalism. It is important to define the unit because that defines the subject matter theoretically and makes it possible to keep track of what should be preserved, in practical terms. What was the Native American philosophical tradition? There are as many Native American philosophies as there are distinct nations and tribes. Over most of its history, their philosophies were transmitted orally from one generation to the next. As American indigenous cultures and tribes were destroyed by war and the loss of ancestral lands. These transmissions were largely lost. Some transmissions were recorded by early anthropologists in condescending ways that distorted them. There are contemporary attempts to reconstitute Native American traditional oral knowledge as critiques of Western philosophy, religion, technology, and economics. Such critiques now form the content of Native American or Indigenous American studies as well as the late 20th century philosophical subfield of Native American philosophy. However, the speeches of 18th and 19th century Native American leaders who sought to resist removal to reservations and preserve the lives, cultures, and lands of their peoples endure as unreconstituted early American philosophy. Noteworthy in this regard is T. Diuskin, who, when he spoke at treaty councils in Pennsylvania, began, I desire all that I have said, may be taken down aright. T. Diuskin. Tenskwatawa, and Sago with us spoke like Americans. What is the problem caused by intersectionality?
the result of all the intersectionalities has been a widely accepted equation that race plus class equals gender. Resulting in a multiplicity of women's genders that prevents the possibility of women working together or even identifying in the same way. And the result of that is an unspecified number of feminisms. Once different women's genders are recognized, it can be very difficult for them to reunite as women. For example in their essay Have We Got a Theory for You? 1998 Maria C. Lagones and Elizabeth V. Spellman use a dialogue to show how some differences in Angla and Latina cultural experience simply cannot be translated into each other's framework of understanding. What were Ralph Waldo Emerson's requirements for a scholar? Emerson thought that much could be learned from ordinary experience and that spirituality was not separate from what was familiar or common. He did not have a high opinion of American academic philosophers. Dismissing their thought as derivative, but he did posit necessary conditions for a scholar. These are, closeness to and experience with nature. Knowledge of the past, and action as the clearest expression of thought. Emerson wrote that thinking is a partial act, but living is a total act. How did the facts of Wollstonecraft's life obscure her work? Mary Wollstonecraft's life was tumultuous in a way that was shocking to her peers and many later thinkers. Her husband, the philosopher William Godwin, 1756-1836, wrote the memoirs of the author of A Vindication. Of the rights of woman a year after Mary had died in childbirth at the age of 37. Godwin the founder of modern anarchism, was vilified by the poet Robert Southey for the want of all feeling in stripping his dead wife naked. And in a satire called The Unsexed Females, a poem, 1798, published by Richard Polbley. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields, London and her father squandered their money and took over her own small inheritance. He drank excessively and beat Mary's mother. Her sisters, Everina and Eliza, were also to have unhappy marriages. In her teens, Mary became friends with Jane Arden, whose family had intellectual interests, and Fanny Blood with whom she later started a school in Newington Green, which was known as a dissenting community. Blood married, became ill, and died. The school fell apart, and Wollstonecraft worked as a governess. Leaving after a year when she decided to support herself by writing. This was a very daring ambition for a woman at the time. And Wollstonecraft called herself the first of a new genus. In London, she was assisted by the publisher Joseph Johnson. She became part of a circle that included Thomas Paine and William Godwin. And supported herself by translating French and German texts after learning those languages. She had an affair with the married artist Henry Fuseli, 
who rejected her when his wife refused a platonic menage a trois. She then wrote Vindication of the Rights of Men, 1790, followed by Vindication of the Rights of Women. 1792, and traveled to France a month before Louis XVI was guillotined. There she fell in love with the adventurer Gilbert Imlay, with whom she had her daughter, Fanny. Imlay rejected Mary, and when she returned to England she twice tried to commit suicide. Eventually, she became romantically attached to Godwin and they married so that their child would be legitimate, though they lived in separate houses. Their daughter, Mary, became Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Fanny committed suicide at the age of 22. What were the important themes in early 20th century analytic philosophy? Analytic philosophy before World War II began with a rejection of British idealism via G. E. Moore's, 1873 to 1958, well-received common sense philosophy and a new rigor in theories of meaning. Introduced by the empiricist Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970. The doctrine of logical atomism, as developed by Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein. 1889 to 1951, flourished for a while. Logical atomism was dependent on truth functional logic for its explication. In other words, analytic philosophers generally turned to logic as the science par excellence that set the standard for philosophy. What was the dispute between Leibniz and Newton about the calculus? Gottfried Leibniz was very sociable intellectually, and welcomed a free and cooperative exchange of ideas. Toward the end of his life, though, he was greatly distressed by the claims of Isaac Newton's, 1643-1727. Advocates that he had in effect plagiarized the discovery of the differential calculus from Newton. Leibniz reported that when he was in England in 1637 he was told about Newton's work on the calculus and wrote to him. Newton replied through an intermediary, although he wrote about the binomial theory and included only the following sentence, in Latin, about the calculus, flux ions. The words of the sentence were presented by Newton, in code, as follows. A A A A A C C D A E E E E E E E E E E E E E E F F I I I I I I I L L L N N N N N N N N N O Q Q Q Q R R S S S S T T T T T T T T T V V V V V V V V V V V V X. It meant, give an equation any whatsoever, flowing quantities involving flux ions to find, and vice versa. No one has ever been able to make sense of what Newton wrote Leibniz. Nor has anyone related it to the differential calculus. Although the string of letters are sometimes quoted to illustrate how unreasonable Newton was. Leibniz then invented a differential calculus on his own showed it to Newton's intermediary, 
and in 1684 published his method. By 1695, Newton's followers were accusing him of plagiarism. Over the centuries, scholars have exonerated Leibniz of plagiarism. The conclusion has been that they each independently invented the calculus and that Newton did so first, although Leibniz published first. How did Peter Lombard answer his question of whether God was the cause of evil and sin? God is of course good and has a good nature. Out of this good nature, God created an angel. This angel became evil after God created him and passed his evil on to man. Evil in man resulted in sin. God was therefore not the first cause of either human evil or sin. Lombard's explanation is similar to how we would explain how a good parent has a bad child at some point. The creation or offspring is morally responsible for itself and Lombard located that point originally in an angel. Lombard, c. 1095-1160, wrote about this and other issues in his four-volume book of sentences. 1145-1151, that soon became a standard text for theological training that was in use until the mid-1200s. Others would begin with his work and then develop their own ideas on its basis. Why were all of Charles Pierce's works published posthumously? Pierce neither published nor prepared for publication the greater part of his work. When he died, his widow, Juliet, sold his papers to the Harvard University Philosophy Department, for $6,000. Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, was supposed to supervise their organization, but he died two years later. Many of the papers were subsequently lost, misplaced, allowed to become disorganized, or simply taken. The late mathematics historian Carolyn Isola, while conducting some research, chanced upon a trunk of Pierce's writings in the mid-1950s in a corner of the basement of Widener Library. The first edition of Pierce's collected papers was put together by Charles Harchern, Paul Weiss, and Arthur Burks during the 1930s. Critics have deemed this collection arbitrary and not truly representative of Pierce's thought. Because it makes Pierce seem unnecessarily obscure and does not clarify the progression of his ideas. A chronological edition, 1989, of Pierce's work, edited by the Pierce Edition Project. Of the Indiana University at Indianapolis, has produced more coherent results. Covering the period from 1857 to 1886. Two other well-regarded efforts are Pierce's Cambridge Conferences. Lectures of 1898, 1992, and Pierce's Harvard Lectures on Pragmatism of 1903, 1997. What does Afrocentrism have to do with philosophy?
African philosophy is of interest to philosophers as a theoretical system of thought. Also, some philosophers have accepted the challenge raised by Afrocentrism. That Western philosophy has excluded the intellectual perspectives of Africans. What was Charles Pierce's pragmatism? Pierce's starting point in his pragmatism was his activity and self-identification as a scientist. Pierce thought that philosophy was philosophy of science and that logic was the logic of science. As a pragmatist, Pierce is best known for two articles, The Fixation of Belief and How to Make Our Ideas Clear. Published in Popular Science Monthly, under different titles, in 1877 and 1878, respectively. In these works, he defended science as the best way to overcome doubt and presented the pragmatist idea of clear concepts. He claimed that concepts, or the meanings of scientific terms, must have cash value. The cash value of a concept is the difference it makes in experience to have the concept compared with not having it. The entire meaning of a clear concept lay in its consequences. The consequences meaning of a scientific concept were possible observations under conditions that could be specified. That is, the concept had to generate predictions and it doesn't matter if the predictions were accurate or not. Just so long as it could predict something that would happen. What was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's political philosophy? In his Foundations of Natural Right, 1796, he supported individualism, but his views changed over time. His Speeches to the German Nation, 1808 Advocated concern for the common good and condemned selfish acts. He argued that egoism was untenable, morally, but that the German people could rise to a higher level because of the innate excellence of their character and language. How did the British Royal Society come about? He British Royal Society grew out of the Invisible College. And the Invisible College was inspired by Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. What is Latin American philosophy? Latin American philosophy is either or both the thought of philosophers who reside in Latin American countries or the newer work of Latino Latina slash Hispanic American philosophers. Like African American and Native American philosophy, it is a subfield to the academic discipline that formed after 1930 although it was not duly recognized until after 1980. Contemporary Considerations of Philosophy in Latin America Written by philosophers who also reflect on the Latino-Latina-Hispanic-American
Experience include the following books, Linda Alcoff and Eduardo Mendieta. Thinking from the Underside of History, Enrique de Sell's Philosophy of Liberation, 2000, Jorge J. E. Gracia, Maria Camurathy, Editors. Philosophy and Literature in Latin America, 1989, Jorge J. E. Gracia and Elizabeth Millenzabert. Editors, Latin American Philosophy for the 21st Century, The Human Condition, Values. And the Search for Identity, 1989, Eduardo Mendieta, Global Fragments, Critical Theory, Latin America and Globalizations. 2007, Susanna Nuxitelli, Latin American Thought, Philosophical Problems and Arguments, 2002. And Ophelia Schutt, Cultural Identity and Social Liberation in Latin American Thought, 1993. How did Pyrrhonic skepticism affect early modern natural philosophy? If there could be no certain knowledge about the world. This left the uncertainty of sense knowledge as the only knowledge available about the world. Modern natural philosophy, or modern science was based on the principle that sense knowledge is the foundation of all our knowledge about the world. Why did philosophy start in ancient Greece? The ancient Greeks had a broad democratic cultural tradition that encouraged individual independence of mind. The questioning of authority, and disagreement among peers. The seafaring, trading, and warring nature of the ancient Greeks was conducive to the development of intellectual cosmopolitanism among the privileged classes in this slave-owning society. From the pre-Socratics on, Greek philosophers were not merely thinkers, but also men of action, capable of leadership and civic involvement. Moreover, the Greeks were warlike and valued the virtues of combat, such as courage and honor. When it came to polite interaction, they did not hesitate to voice disagreement. A trait conducive to philosophical debate, as well. How was skepticism related to the scientific revolution? The re-emergence of ancient Greek skepticism toward the end of the Renaissance was not at first, related to the rise of scientific inquiry. Rather, Catholic and Protestant theologians used skepticism as a tool to further argue their positions during the Reformation and Counter-Reformation and Catholics also used it to affirm mysticism and simple faith as the paths to real knowledge. What is Catherine McKinnon's argument against pornography? According to McKinnon, Pornography not only exploits and objectifies those women who are its subjects, but it also expresses and supports the overall oppression of women in society. 
the subordinate status of women in pornography. As well as the violence against women depicted in so many of its forms, is part of an unjust sex gender system. What are some highlights of Jane Addams' life that led her to found Hull House? Adams' father was a mill owner and politician in Cedarville, Illinois. Her mother died when she was two, while giving birth to her ninth child. Adams attended Rockford Seminary, a women's college, failed in medical school, and became depressed for a decade, during which she traveled throughout Europe. Along the way she visited London's Toynbee Hall, which was a young men's community that helped poor Jewish and Irish immigrants in East London by working within these people's neighborhoods. Adams resolved to duplicate this plan. And in 1889 she founded Hull House in the near west side community of Chicago. Hull House was run and operated by women. Adams had long-term relationships with her co-founder and college friend. Ellen Gates Starr, and, later on, with her colleague Mary Rosette Smith. Adams' work at Hull House, and other settlement houses based on it. Made her well known she became a very popular public speaker. She was involved in the founding of other progressive organizations, such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Former President Theodore Roosevelt asked her to second his nomination for the presidency by the Bull Moose Progressive Party in 1912. Roosevelt had served three years as U.S. President after 1901, and a full term after 1904. The Progressive Party strongly supported women's rights and suffrage. However, Adams became a target for intense public criticism when she expressed both pacifist and feminist views before World War I. Toward the end of her life, she dedicated herself to world peace and African-American civil rights. Was there only one kind of religious life for Sren Kierkegaard? No, Kierkegaard distinguished between two. In the first, the individual relates to God, using his idea of God to deal with guilt. In the second, there is a teleological suspension of the ethical, as in the story of Abraham and Isaac. The implication of this transcendence of the ethical is that real religion is higher and more important than what is accepted as goodness in society. What was Gottlob Frege's main innovation in the philosophy of logic? Freya treated predicates as functions and subjects as arguments. Thus Socrates is mortal becomes function mortal is applied to argument Socrates. In his conceptual notation, 1879, Freya also introduced a simple way to 
treat words and terms such as all and there is as logical quantifiers. Logical quantification is a notational system that connects a variable with what is being talked about. For example, in the sentence every person alive today will die someday. Person alive today is being talked about and every is the quantifier. This treatment of phrase still stands today. What is anarchism? Anarchism is a theory and political movement that is based on ideals of freedom and equality. All forms of domination, authority, and subordination are considered unjust and backed up by force. The state and all of its supporting institutions. As well as the institutions supported by the state, are deemed unacceptable. Society should be reorganized into small, self-governing communities in which Members cooperate toward the same ends and produce their livelihood together. English journalist and political philosopher William Godwin, 1756 to 1836, initiated modern anarchism in the 18th century. And in the 19th, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, 1809 to 1865. Mikhail Alexandrovich Bakunin 1814 to 1876 and Peter Alexeyevich Kropotkin 1842 to 1921 were leading figures What was Arthur Schopenhauer's influence Schopenhauer's philosophical ideas influenced Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900. And his idea of an unconscious will was formative for Sigmund Freud's, 1856-1939, ideas of psychology. Schopenhauer had profound effects in literature and was the first. Significant Western philosopher to incorporate Eastern thought in his system. What were Voltaire's main contributions to philosophy? In his letters concerning the English nation, 1734, published as part of his philosophical letters. Voltaire introduced a French audience to the ideas of John Locke, 1632-1704, and Isaac Newton, 1643-1727. At the same time, he offered political criticism of the ancient regime which was to motivate the French Revolution. Against Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662, who in the previous century had counseled quietism and claimed that suffering on earth was excellent preparation for heaven. Voltaire argued for the betterment of human life in the here and now. Voltaire's letter on Mr. Locke in his Philosophical Dictionary took up a possibility raised by Locke of matter being able to think. However, later in life, he retreated to a skeptical position on such materialism after it was taken up by the philosophes in defense of atheism. What was Wilfred Seller's idea of functionalism?
Wilfred Sellers, 1912-1989, introduced the concept in his 1956 paper, Empiricism and Philosophy of Mind. According to Sellers, there can be no mental foundations of knowledge such as sense data. And he also rejected the pragmatist's myth of the given. By the given, the pragmatists referred to that part of experience that is not influenced by the perceiver or thinker. Functionalism, as developed by Sellers, as well as Hilary Putnam, 1926. In his early writings, is the thesis that mental states can be defined by three things. What causes them, their effects on other mental states, and their effects on behavior. That is, mental states can be understood in terms of their functions which operate like the software of a computer. What was Plotinus' association with demonology? In his biography of Plotinus, 205-270, Porphyry, 233-309, wrote the following. An Egyptian priest came to Rome once and made acquaintance with Plotinus through a friend. The priest wanted to test his powers and suggested Plotinus to make the daimon that was born with him visible by conjuring. Plot Inus gave a ready assent and conjuration took place in the temple of Isis. Because it was, as it is told, the only pure place the Egyptian could find in Rome. When the daimon was conjured to reveal itself, a god appeared who was not one of the daimons. And the Egyptian is said to have called out, Blessed are you. Because a god is by you as your daimon and not some low-class daimon. But there was no opportunity to ask anything from the apparition or look at it longer. Because a friend who was watching and holding birds in his hands to keep the purity of the place. Squeezed them to death, be it out of envy or vague fear. Scholars have found this passage interesting because it introduces two new elements to ideas about demons in the ancient world, first, that demons could change into benevolent gods or angels, and second, that birds could be used to protect the purity of the soul. Socrates had a daimon who would counsel him in times of stress or alert him to what was important. However, Plotinus' interactions with demons more resembles later ideas of magic and sorcery than simply listening to a voice, as Socrates did. Did Rousseau support a free society? Not exactly. Like Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, he held that structure and government authority are necessary to safeguard individual freedoms. Once they have entered into the social contract, citizens retain sovereignty. But the general will, or what is good for the community, is enacted by legislators into laws. This general will, or communal good, may at times be opposed to what is simply good for the majority. 
Rousseau's proposal for the ideal society was thus focused on the end or goal of that society. He thought that direct democracy was usually the best means for achieving that end in small societies. But in larger societies representative democracy, or even monarchy, would be more appropriate. Rousseau also advocated some form of state religion that would be binding on all citizens and require their participation for the sake of social coherence and stability. What was Gottlob Frege's landmark insight about meaning? Freya's theory of language was set forth in three essays. Function and concept, on concept and object, and sense and reference. He noted that some identity statements are true and informative. For example, the sentence Venus is Venus, does not tell me anything, but the sentence. The morning star is the evening star, is informative, although it means the same as Venus is Venus. Because Venus is in fact both the morning star and the evening star. What were the ideas of the main religious existentialists? Martin Buber, 1878-1965, connected existentialism to Judaism by emphasizing that whereas Christians have direct individual relationships to God, the Jewish relationship to God is mediated by membership in a community. As a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, after he left Vienna in 1938, Buber tried to reconcile Jews and Arabs. Buber criticized the subject-object form of knowledge as a mode in both human and religious relationships. In its place, he advocated an I-Thou relationship that recognized the subjectivity of the other. His main work is I and Thou, 1923. Carl Jaspers, 1883-1969, thought that philosophy should help human beings with their projects of self-discovery toward a goal of existence, or authentic selfhood, based on an understanding of one's own life. Although not a traditional theologian, Jaspers nevertheless addressed individual spiritual yearnings. His main works are Philosophy, 1932, On the Origin and Goal of History, 1949, and Way to Wisdom, 1950. Gabriel Marcel, 1889-1973, was both a philosopher and a playwright who addressed human existence in terms of community and personal relationships. He emphasized we are, instead of I am, drawing on both Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, and Buber. He also approached philosophy as a Bergsonian intuitionist by relying on his immediate insights for his views, rather than arriving at them through argument. His main works include Mystery of Being, 1951, and Man Against Mass Society, 1955. His William James Lectures at Harvard University, 1961-1962, were published as the existential background of human dignity. Simone Weil, 1909-1943, 
was born into a Jewish Parisian family but converted first to leftist syndicalism, which was a Marxist political movement with the goal of putting labor unions in control of both industry and government. Her subsequent religious thought was a combination of Neoplatonism, Christianity, and Jewish mysticism. She was an activist on behalf of the democratically elected government during the Spanish Civil War and for the French resistance during World War II. She criticized the way in which Marxism had become a religion. To some and objected to the dehumanizing effects of capitalism. Her solution was meaningful work as a fundamental human need. Her main writings, published posthumously, are Gravity and Grace, 1947, and Oppression and Liberty, 1955. Who was William James? William James, 1842-1910, built on Charles Pierce's, 1839-1914. Pragmaticist ideas to create a more humanistic form of pragmatism. James was also the founder of modern psychology as a science independent of subjective introspection. His principal works include The Principles of Psychology, 1890, The Will to Believe and Other Essays in Popular Philosophy. 1897, The Varieties of Religious Experience, 1901-1902, and Pragmatism, 1907. What are Afrocentrism and the African Diaspora? In the United States, Afrocentrism begins with the premise that American slaves and through intergenerational cultural inheritance if not a now untenable biological essentialism their descendants, came from Africa. At the time when the original slave populations were kidnapped from Africa. Africa had fully developed religions, cultures, cities and civilizations dating before ancient Western philosophy. The involuntary implantations of Africans, as slaves in the Americas and Europe resulted in a forced scattering, or diaspora, from those African origins. The reclamation of their African heritage on the part of African Americans results in a different perspective than the dominant white view that African slaves were forced. Immigrants without original cultures comparable to the cultures of those who enslaved them. Afrocentrism is thus a foundation for a new African-American pride, in both origins and contemporary identity. Through cultural inheritance, for all groups and their members who are part of the African diaspora. A new legitimate foundation of culture, complete with its own art, architecture, poetry, styles of clothing, food, and everyday habits, is therefore claimed. It needs to be emphasized that this is in contrast to the culture of slave cabins, slave field labor, or slave service in the homes of masters, complete with a loss of original names. On through the oppressively degrading conditions of segregation, disproportionate incarceration, Ghetto living conditions, 
the destruction of traditional black nuclear families and neighborhoods. And a general sense of being both the cause and object of America's unique race problem. Afrocentrism is thereby a perspective of encouragement and racial uplift. Sources on Afrocentrism include Martin Bernal's Black Athena. The Afroasiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, 3 Volumes, 1987-2006, Lewis R. Gordon's Her Majesty's Other Children, Sketches of Racism from a Neocolonial Age. 1997, and Molify Asante's The Afrocentric Idea, 1987. Philosophy says to Boethius, what is it, mortal man, that has cast you down into grief and mourning? You have seen something unwanted, it would seem, something strange to you. But if you think that fortune has changed towards you, you are wrong. These are ever her ways, this is her very nature. She has with you preserved her own constancy by her very change. She was ever changeable at the time when she smiled upon you. When she was mocking you with the allurements of false good fortune. You have discovered both the different faces of the blind goddess. That Boethius could have an angel appear to him is an occurrence with roots in Neoplatonist theurgy, or magic. And that the angel instills peace of mind in the face of turmoil and apparent misfortune evokes a decidedly stoic doctrine. What was Immanuel Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative? According to Kant, all rational beings are intrinsically valuable. And in the kingdom of ends, no one is a means to the end of anyone else. In the world of affairs what we do and who we are have prices. But in the kingdom of ends there are no prices, only dignities. The second formulation of the categorical imperative is that one must always act to treat humanity. Either as another person or oneself, as an end and never as a means. In other words, don't use people. What was Aristotle's main contribution to Western philosophy? Aristotle, 384-322b. CE, curbed the strain of intellectual mysticism that had been inaugurated by Parmenides. C 515 to 450 BCE, and he formalized common sense in ways that checked the speculative excesses of his teacher. Plato, C 428 C 348 BCE. This enabled a solid foundation for empiricism. Or knowledge based on sensory observation and direct experience. Aristotle accomplished his task via encyclopedic accounts of the existing knowledge of his day. Assessments of that knowledge, and developments of it into new areas, using new methods of thought. 
he was a rare combination of a highly well-informed and diligent scholar and an original thinker. Like his 19th century successor George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. 1770 to 1831, Aristotle was capable of thinking the whole world. But unlike Hegel, he thought of the whole world not as an abstract and speculative theorist would but as an ordinary person would, if he or she could do that. What was Jill Deleuze like as a person? He did not like to furnish autobiographical information, claiming, academics' lives are seldom interesting. His fingernails were extremely long, but when it was suggested that this was a sign of eccentricity, he replied, I haven't got the normal protective whirls, so that touching anything, especially fabric, causes such irritation that I need long nails to protect them. In the same interview he said that the fact that he did not travel did not mean an absence of inner journeys. What was philosophically significant about 19th century psychology and social theory? In the 19th century, the foundations were laid for psychology and sociology to develop as distinct fields separate from philosophy. The reasons for their separation are differences in subject matter as well as methodology. Concerning the latter, Wilhelm Dilthe, 1833-1911, put the case of his age best in claiming that human sciences such as history, psychology, philology and philosophy were characterized by a need to understand, whereas the physical sciences sought causes. However, in the 20th century, quantitative methodology and experiments in search of causes were to characterize important parts of both psychology and sociology. Quantification and causal explanation were also to characterize economics, which did not become distinctly independent from political philosophy, sociology, and philosophy until the 20th century. But in the 19th century, the establishment of psychology and sociology as separate from epistemology, ethics, and political philosophy, as well as revolutionary critique, was a major achievement. What were some of Josiah Royce's metaphysical ideas? Royce's metaphysical system was intended to solve the problems posed by a religious worldview. He believed that what exists is a totality of everything that is known. So that the nature of being can be understood by understanding how it comes to be known. Although knowledge starts with data from the senses, to arrive at the idea of a public object as well as a past and future, transcendence is necessary. Transcendental judgment is not isolated, but part of a system of judgments. Such a system can account for error as a failure to define an object. An idea is a purpose that seeks an object, 
but the object in turn clarifies the original idea. The infinite is real, because the absolute, which is one, represents itself along with everything else that mirrors it. When did medicine become separate from philosophy? Although Hippocrates of Kos II, or Hippocrates of Kos, c. 465-370 BCE, is credited with being the father of medicine, Aristotle and Theophrastus. 371 c. 287 BCE, wrote about Alcmion of Croton as the founder of medicine during the second half. Of the 6th century BCE Alcmion also investigated the functions of the different senses. Because the process of understanding was similar to the rotations of the stars. He thought that the soul, like the stars, was immortal. He speculated that sense organs relate information to the brain through passages. When blood moved to the large blood vessels, the result was sleep. Whereas when it became redistributed the result was wakefulness. The specific nature of Alcmion's ideas, and his introduction to medicine of principles unique to that subject. Forever changed the practice of medicine and systematic thought about the human body. As Alcmion's successor, Hippocrates, 465 to 370 BCE, was able to build on his thought and establish medicine as a science in its own right. What was Hobbes' belief about free will? In his The Questions Concerning Liberty, Necessity, and Chance. 1656, Hobbes called his position on free will necessitarianism. He said there was nothing in the human mind to which the word will refers. In other words, there was no will. But there is desire. And what we call will is the last desire before we make up our minds to do something. The entire person can be free, however. Human freedom, according to Hobbes, consists in not being prevented from doing what one desires to do. Freedom, in his view, is thus nothing more or less than liberty. Hobbes also believed that all actions have causes or are necessitated. But we are responsible legally for what we do because it is. Just that we be punished for our decision or will in the matter. The purpose of such punishment is to deter others from misbehaving and preserve justice. <laughs>